Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a relatively new series. This is lesson four in that series on the least of these, ministering to those in need. And we're going to focus particularly on what it says in the books of Proverbs and Psalms. And this lesson is entitled Mercy and Justice in Psalms and Proverbs. It's lesson number four for July 27 of 2019. As usual, we're going to ask you to bow with us in prayer as we begin. Our wonderful Father, as usual, we bow here enjoying the privilege we have to come and sit around this table and talk about you. And now as we look at these words of wisdom from so long ago, may we learn what you had in mind for us through those words is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the question that we need to really sort of focus on this in this lesson, I think, is should our spirituality impact every bit thing we do, every minute of our lives, every day? Yes. yes. That's the goal. Well, we the have book a of choice to follow the spirit or the flesh. Yeah. Okay. So. The books of Psalms and Proverbs talk about everyday living. It should be clear that these books picture God as having an impact on everything we do. But, in our world we see injustice, violence, evil permeating almost everything. Why is that? Where, where is God when we need Him? We live in a world of sin. We chose the knowledge of evil in addition to the knowledge of good. So, um, yeah. Are the widow, the orphan, and the poor being treated fairly in our world? Occasionally, but not Occasionally. <laughs> Usually <laughs> not. You asked a question there a few seconds ago. Jeremiah seventeen nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? Yeah. <laughs> doesn't leave very many well, people out of that one, does it? So let's think about this for a moment. In many of the more developed countries in the world, we, we tend to think that the government is responsible for justice. Is that the way it should be? Or do we have some individual responsibility for justice? Well, the government is our delegated authority. Oh, mm-hmm. in a, uh, so if we hand over our authority... Democracy. Okay, we hand over that uh, responsibility to the government. We can sit back and say, Phew. "No, it's a, you know we're still responsible to the st- extent that we can, but mm-hmm. um, collectively we we need some help." It's interesting to notice that Psalms and Proverbs are written in poetic form in Hebrew. Hebrew poetry isn't exactly like our poetry, but nevertheless, it's Hebrew poetry. And it was tended. It was intended to be sung. That was the way it was originally intended. And it made it easier to memorize. I don't know. We uh, used to have a habit in our family that I thought was wonderful. We had a small book that had a whole collection of scripture songs. And every week we learned a new scripture song. And I still remember those songs. You think that whenever I come across that verse, of course, the, the tune sort of pops up in my mind. So, memorizing to a tune is a wonderful way to remember things. If you went to an Adventist church in Pakistan on the Sabbath day, mm-hmm. you'd hear them singing Zubur, Zuburi songs. Mm-hmm. They sing the songs. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm not sure. There might be other countries, but I know for sure Pakistan they do. Here's a, an example from the Psalms, the ninth Psalm, starting with verse 7. But the Lord is king forever. He has set up his throne for judgment. He rules the world with righteousness. He judges the nations with justice. The Lord is... And by the way, notice in Hebrew parallelism, the Hebrew, there's, it says, He rules the world with righteousness. He judges, that goes along with rules the world, with justice. So righteousness and justice are supposed to be the same thing. The Lord is a refuge for the re- oppressed, a place of safety in times of trouble. So oppressed, trouble... Those who know you, Lord, will trust you. You do not abandon anyone who comes to you. Sing praise to the Lord who rules in Zion. Tell every nation what he has done. God remembers those who suffer. He does not forget their cry, and he punishes those who wrong them. But be merciful to me, O Lord. See the thing, sufferings my enemies cause me. 
Rescue me from death, O Lord, that I may stand before the people of Jerusalem and tell them all the things for which I praise you. I will rejoice because you saved me. The heathen have dug a pit and fallen in. They have been caught in their own trap. The Lord has revealed himself by his righteous judgments and the wicked are trapped by their own deeds. Death is the destiny of all the wicked, of all those who reject God. The needy will not always be neglected. The hope of the poor will not be crushed forever. Come, Lord, do not let human beings defy you. Bring the heathen before you and pronounce judgment on them. Make them afraid, O Lord. Make them know that they are only mortal beings. Does that sound like a fair thing to have happen? We're talking about justice here, right? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of other psalms that we could have quoted that say more or less that same message. God is still ruler of the universe. He will judge fairly and righteously. Death will be the reward of the wicked, but eternal life will be the reward of the righteous. Can we be sure of that? Not too sure? No. Sure, we can be sure. In the end. Yeah. yeah, in the end. Exactly. That's what we're talking about. In the end. So, every Christian, if their faith is firmly fixed in, in, in scripture, the truths of Scripture, no matter what we go through here on this earth, we know at the other end there's going to be what? Eternal life, peace with God, and so forth. Well, in our day, to many people, thinking about God's justice, they're afraid. It makes them pray just to think about it. Should that be true? Depends on what guilt you're carrying at the moment. Okay, so if you're guilty, you fear to face a righteous judge, right? If you're not guilty, do you fear to face a righteous judge? You shouldn't need to. You just hope the judge is righteous. Yeah, that's <laughs> just part hope of the, the equation. judge oh, yeah. is righteous. Good lawyer. Gary, I think you have something about that. Yes. Uh, this came from Reflections on the Psalms by C.S. Lewis. Thousands of people who have been stripped of all they possess and who have the right entirely on their side will at last be heard. Of course, they are not afraid of judgment. They know their case is unanswerable, if only it could be heard. When God comes to judge, at last it will. So, no matter what happens here, when the final judgment takes place, what's going to happen? The truth, I think of a famous trial that happened here some 20, 3, 4, 5 years ago now. And it was... The, our nation, the United States, was glued to their television set. The whole, it, all three channels, the major channels. It was, it was every day in this thing. And it went on, and it went on, and it went on, and they argued about this, and they argued about the, the other. And it was a question about whether a certain man had killed his ex-wife who was with another man. And, uh, I, you know, it's, I, I think about how God would deal with that case. And, and how he would be fair. He would say, okay, sit down, everybody relax. And he would put the screen up there. And he would say, okay, just watch exactly what happened. And when it was done, he would say, everybody have, anybody have any questions? Yeah, okay. And it would be over. Because there it would be perfectly obvious to everybody. And not only that, but God knows the motives yes. of the people involved. Well, there are psalms again, like Psalm 82, that seem to call for God to do something. Wicked people are judging unfairly and accepting bribes. They are abusing the orphans, the widows, and the needy, and the helpless. And what does Psalm 82 say about judges who behave in these ways? Well, look especially at verse 6. You are gods, I said. All of you are children of the Most High, but you will die like mortals. Your life will end like that of any prince. You are gods? Elohim. What? What's going on there? Well, it's interesting that Jesus quotes that. In, in discussion about the Bible, look at John chapter 10, verse 33. They replied, We do not want to stone you because of any good deeds, but because of your blasphemy. You're only a man, but you're trying to make yourself God. So what has Jesus answered? It is written in your own law that God said, You are God's. Right out of right out of Psalms. Well, you got that back to Psalms eighty-two. Then you go over to Jeremiah ten eleven. Mm-hmm. Basically, same as 
uh, restates what it says in Psalms 82. And uh, you gods that are not the creator will die like men. Mm-hmm. Well, what are these verses trying to say to us? In handling people's lives, often earthly judges are acting as if they were God. Asaph concluded his psalm by calling on God to come and rule the nations and judge fairly. Unfortunately, the children of Israel did not live up to God's guidance, as we know, given so carefully to Moses. Judges and even priests became selfish and accepted bribes and the poor were exploited. And you can read about that in the Minor Prophets. Well, Ellen White commented in the Prophets and Kings where she said in page 198, Judges are appointed to act as judges under him, that is, God. Do all the judges act as if they were acting on behalf of God? What kind of a world would we live in if all the judges and all the presidents and all the rulers and all the congresses and the parliaments acted as if they were acting on behalf of God? Not too sure? It would be a lot different. (laughs) Things they were allowed to, you know, because they, if they referenced God's law as opposed to uh, the laws of man, uh, what's the term that they use in courts uh, for stuff that's been established through yeah. law of the land? Precedent. Pre- uh, precedent. Yeah, precedent. Uh, but uh, anyway, there's a there's another term. Uh, in other words, that uh, if it's been ruled this way somewhere else then you can bring that in and if it's been ruled somewhere else then you bring that in so it becomes kind of like uh, every man just uh, a very interesting illustration of the difference between God's judgment and human judgment happened when Jesus stood in judgment before Caiaphas and what did Jesus say to him someday God is going to judge and you are going to be on trial and Caiaphas reacted in horror and what did he do? He tore his clothes which was completely forbidden. He's going to face that one day. Well, when the poor and the needy cry out for help, how does God respond? Does he rain down food from heaven? Occasionally. Occasionally. Tries to prompt us. He tries to prompt us, okay? Are there poor and needy in our communities? Absolutely. Yes. Anyway. Are there any of them who really need to hear not, not only are, are, are physically hungry, but are spiritual hunger, spiritually hungry? Yes. How do we find those people and reach out to them? Well, there are people that are spiritually deprived, but they may not appreciate that they are. Yeah. Maybe some of, uh, some of us are. are. Uh, what about um, people who stand on the street corners and ask for money so they can buy alcohol or drugs? Are we supposed to help those people? We can take them to a, a restaurant or something and feed them a meal. Yeah, that's a possibility. I've tried to give some, some food, and I don't want that. I, it might be poisoned. Yeah. <laughs> there used to be a guy at one of the off ramps that just says, had a little sign, why lie? I just want a beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had. I don't I, lie. So I need beer. I, I saw that once. So um, he had people stopping and giving. Um, I have some friends who used to talk about a guy that would wait in the in the in the parking lot of the supermarket. So maybe he really did want food, and he would. They would say to him, "Okay, you wait there for a minute," and they would come out with not only all their groceries but a bag of food, and the guy was there. They would give him the bag of food. Well, that was probably a, a good example. Well, of that. to push it a little bit, they even did studies on panhandlers, and mm-hmm. uh, they found that these folk make an average of seventy-three thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Don't have to pay taxes. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, Charles, you have something to yes, about sir. the vows of David, recorded in one hundred and first Psalm should be the vows of all upon whom rest the responsibilities of guarding the influences of the home. Ellen White, Driven Herald, October 12, 1911.
Okay, so and the home is the foundation of society, so what are we saying from that? These these vows that David made, and if we had time we would read that whole psalm, it sounds like he's he's setting up rules for how he wants to rule his government. And they're they're wonderful rules. If you get a chance, read Psalm one oh one. By honoring God, David in turn expected God's assistance, not only directly from God himself, but also through the assistance of wise counselors to administer justice and mercy in his work as king. Are we ministering justice and mercy in whatever ways we can in our daily work and other activities? Now, we may not work in the judicial system, as we call it today, but do we have any ways of, as healthcare workers or other kind of workers of administering justice? Or is that just for the people in the judicial system? I want to go back to David himself. Mm -hmm. He had a wonderful heart. The Lord himself called the man after my own heart. But uh, he was not a very successful father. No, he didn't do too well with his kids, did he? No, he did not. And after, of course, Solomon, everything fell apart. So luckily, thankfully, the Lord looks at our hearts. Mm -hmm. God described him as a man after his own heart when he was a young man, <laughs> long before watching, he was king. <laughs> watching flock in the field. Look at another psalm, and this one's a fairly short one. I'm going to read it again. Psalm 146. These last f- five psalms in the book of Psalms talk about praising God. In praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise him as long as I live. I will sing to my God all my life. Don't put your trust in human leaders. No human being can save you. When they die, they return to the dust. On that day, all their plans come to an end. Happy are those who have the God of Jacob to help them and who depend on the Lord their God, the creator of heaven, earth, and sea, and all that is in them. He always keeps his promises. He judges in favor of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free and gives sight to the blind. He lifts those who have fallen. He loves his righteous people. He protects the strangers who live in our land. He helps widows and orphans, but takes the wicked to their ruin. The Lord is king forever. Your God, O Zion, will reign for all time. Praise the Lord. This is King David writing. Yeah. Doesn't that sound like a good thing? Yes. So it's... We're not, we're not specifically told who may have written that written. one. Probably, probably David. But, uh, Gordon, uh, of course, when he was young, his heart was just pure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so even when he grew older, he still wanted to think that he, he wanted to be right with the Lord. Yeah. Then he goofed up, then he wanted to be. That's mm-hmm. Psalms 51, even. Yeah, then. Yeah. He had some <laughs> good things in, okay. even then. Yeah. After the experience with Bathsheba. Do you do you think this Psalm one chapter read is only talking about the future and the kingdom of heaven or or could some of that be true in our day? Well we to the extent that we follow God's direction. Yeah. At that time, of course, when we think of God taking care of the, the poor and the widow and such, um, that would be within a system that that where the people are his hands and his feet, you know, in terms of providing, you know. The let's, let's think about that. Let me, let me build on what you just said. Sometimes people, Christians, feel like we need to go out and help the poor and the needy and so forth because God has commanded us to do that. No, God is inviting us to join him in doing that. He's already doing it. Think of what a privilege it would be to work side by side with God. Wouldn't that be a privilege? Dennis, I think you have something on that. Yes, this is uh, from a letter that Ellen White wrote in 1901, and you'll find it in 7th volume of the Testimonies 226, paragraph 2. Take away suffering and need, and we should have no way of understanding the mercy and love of God, no way of knowing the compassionate, sympathetic Heavenly Father. Never does the gospel put on an aspect of greater loveliness than when it is brought to the most needy and destitute regions. Then it is that its light shines forth with the clearest radiance and the greatest power. Truth from the word of God enters the hovel of the peasant. Rays from the sun of righteousness light up the rude cottage of the poor, bringing gladness to the sick and suffering. 
Angels of God are there, and the simple faith shown makes the crust of bread and the cup of water a banquet. The sin-pardoning Savior welcomes the poor and ignorant and gives them to eat of the bread that comes down from heaven. They drink the water of life. Those who have been loathed and abandoned are through faith and pardon raised to the dignity of sons and daughters of God. Limited above the world, they sit lifted Lifted. above the world. They sit in heavenly places in Christ. They may have no earthly treasure, but they have found the pearl of great price. The sin-pardoning Savior receives the poor and ignorant and gives them to eat of the bread which comes down from heaven. They drink of the water of life. Wow. Mm -hmm. Think about what it would be like to receive a letter like that. So tell me about it. Do you... Do you find yourself in a closer relationship with God as a result of working for others? When you when you have the opportunity to reach out to the poor and so forth, how does that impact you? Well, to the extent that you can meet their mm-hmm. immediate needs, there's uh, joy in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the extent that you can't, then you go to Jesus and ask, you know, how can I... Uh, help these people I, I I don't have enough My, much like the person who uh, had a uh, person at midnight come a stranger and and he didn't have food so he went to his neighbor and he knocked on the door and woke him up and said I, I have nothing to give this person so we're, we're kind of like that and Jesus is kind of like the neighbor who has something that, mm-hmm. that can yeah. provide. And it might be us, or it might be somebody that we can refer that person to uh, or call on to help uh, in the situation. But all of that is kind of a cyclic dynamic, you know. You see needs, you respond with what you have. If you don't have enough, then you look for other ways, other means, and that's a growth. I, I find it's a real blessing Every day, I, I have to go out of my way to find ways to help others, and I, I just I find that's a blessing, just to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna. I, I don't stop and tell myself, okay, I'm gonna do this because God wants me to. I think this is something I enjoy doing, and I am, I have the privilege of doing that on behalf of God right now. People, today or this afternoon, I was helping a, a young man who's has to leave to go back to school very quickly and he's quite seriously sick and several people have tried to help him so I said well let me see what I can do I went about my way and checked with this person that person and so forth and got some instructions here and there so that uh, hopefully we'll be able to help him found the right person who supposedly could help him so and but that's that those are some of the ways that we can we can be blessed as we try to reach out to others our problem in this country is not so much hunger as perhaps malnourishment. Uh, having said that, um, needs are different with different people, and I think here it's uh, <coughs> people are lonely. Loneliness uh, is uh, horrible, uh, mm-hmm. and for us Christians to be able to reach out to folk, even to put our arms on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and uh, just a few minutes of talking um, speaks volumes and gives them so much of assurance. And yeah. I got a, a, a tiny little award today and at work, and the, this was an award given to uh, doctors who, in, in, our, in our big clinic that we work at, that have had a number of people, patients, who responded and say, you did wonderful things for us. We appreciate it so much. And so we got a little pin to, to put on my jacket. And uh, one of the per- patient, one of the patients uh, who, one of my patients said, appreciate so much that doc- what Dr. Hart does. He gives us hugs. Yeah. And, you know, not everybody appreciates that, but a lot of people do. I think it's, you don't always, you don't even at times think you're doing something. Mm-hmm. It's what they observe. Yeah. I've had that two or three times in psych nursing. And one of them, I was in charge this day, and I had everything going and was checking to make sure the staff that I'd assigned were doing whatever. And I walked down one end of a corridor, 
and the female staff had some f fresh female patients and there was a, fil a tallish young white lady I w as I came by she said excuse me do you work here and I said yes why and she didn't get into it she just says thank God you're here now I know I'll be saved hmm. and that had to have come from a previous night shift at county hospital where women weren't always that safe yeah and I probably s squashed some young buck who wanted the wrong kind of behavior and I put a stop to it but I mean that brought it home to me. I had no idea that she'd seen me anywhere, something mm -hmm. like that. Well, turning now to the book of Proverbs, we think of Proverbs as a book full of pithy, short, wise statements about life. Uh, if you want to read a few, try Proverbs 10, verse 4, 13, verses 23 and 25, 14, verses 30, verse 31, 15, verses 15 to 16, 19, verses... 15 and 17 and 30 verses 6, 7 and 9, just as some examples. In these verses, it is suggested repeatedly that good, conscientious work will benefit you, but being lazy will make you poor. If you oppress poor people, you are insulting God because God, because God is their creator and heavenly and father. Proverbs 19, 17 suggests that when you give to the poor, it is like lending to the Lord. The Lord will pay you back. Could that be true in our day? How would the Lord pay us back? All kinds of ways. Your health. Mm -hmm. Well, we do not know what the background is of each poor person we happen to come across. Sometimes they're poor because of circumstances beyond their control, sometimes because of poor choices, either on their part or on the parts of others, or even exploitation. But whatever their situation, God is still their creator and father. Look at Proverbs 22, verses 2 and then 22 and 23. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. And then verse 22 and 23. Don't take advantage of the poor just because you can. Don't take advantage of those who stand helpless in court. The Lord will argue their case for them and threaten the life of anyone who threatens theirs. Hmm, the Lord will threaten the lives of anybody? Wow. Wow. He did everything possible to give them an equal ground. I think every 49th year, mm -hmm. um, give out the land, even if you bought it, return it. You know, mm -hmm. So uh, maybe, is that a Christian uh, socialism? Um, uh, whatever we call it. The, but the Lord yeah. gave. There's a very important, and maybe we should just say this, because there's a lot of people talking about socialism. God did not intend for the government to take over those responsibilities. Those responsibilities of reaching out to the poor were supposed to be handled locally yes. by the local churches. That's the way that should be handled. Because the local people understand the situation. They, 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 they're able to investigate what's going on with that person and so forth and try to help them and so forth. Uh, government programs, one size fits all, never work very well. And you have, as I said when we brought this up at the other lesson, the giving without love and receiving without gratitude. Yeah. It's just a tax. Pro for yeah. So probably neighbors are supposed to help those in poor. And what the neighbors are unable to do, then the church comes in. Yes. And the government's kind of a last resort. Yeah. Well, what do you think of some, I'm sorry, Proverbs 16, verse 8? It is better to have a little honestly earned than to have a large income gained dishonestly. Is that true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we honest and fair in all our dealings? Do you find that business, government, and other agencies with which you must deal each day are fairest, fair and honest in their dealings? Uh, uh, not always. Well, Another bunch of passages here, Proverbs 14, 5 and 25, 16, 11 to 13, 17, 15, 20, 23, 21, 28, and 28, 14 to 16. These passages talk about being honest and dealing not only in business, in other words, have fair weights and all that kind of stuff, but also in what we say each day. Are we ever tempted to tell lies just because it's more convenient, maybe even just time-saving to do so at that moment? If you're, if you're feeling terrible and you still think you have to go to work 
is it okay to some, when someone just sort of passes you and say, how are you? Is it all right to say I'm fine? Well, it depends on how sincere the question was. <laughs> yeah. you know, if, they're, if they're just being superficial, then they're really not... They don't really expect you to answer. They expect you to, to open up and give a, a detailed answer about things. Um, there are different levels of friendship and different levels of questions. You know, okay. those who know that I'm undergoing treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they come up and ask, how are you doing? Uh, in general, I'm doing pretty well. You know, treatment is going on, and I can uh, tell them, you know, I've got one more session to go, and hopefully that will take care of it. A um, few side effects, but uh, on the whole, things are going well. Uh, so, to some people, I, I could be more specific, uh, but if it's just somebody passing on the street, yep. I'm not going to open up all of that <laughs> yep. stuff. Well, is there anything we can do or should do if we see others being unfairly dealt with by governments or businesses? It's easy to feel sorry for someone like that, but is there truly anything we can do? Sometimes. Sometimes. You know the right people. As we have already suggested, the Psalms and the Proverbs deal with many different aspects of life. And Gordon, I think you have some words on that. Ellen White from Patriarchs and Prophets, 754. The Psalms of David pass through the whole range of experience, from the depths of conscious guilt and self-condemnation to the loftiest faith and the most exalted communing with God. His life record declares that sin can bring only shame and woe, bring, yeah, but that God's love and mercy can reach to the deepest depths, that faith will lift up the repenting soul to share the adoption of the sons of God. Of all the assurances which his word contains, it is one of the strongest testimonies to the faithfulness, the justice, and the covenant mercy of God. Wow. Amen. Patriarchs and Prophets, 754, huh? Mm. And then what about the book of Proverbs? I think she said some words about that as well. Myra? Yeah. This is uh, from the book Education. These are principles with which we are bound up the well-being of society, of both secular and religious associations. It is these principles that give se security to property and life. For all who makes, for all that makes confidence and cooperation possible, the world is indebted to the law of God as given in his word and is still traced in lines often obscure and well nigh obliterated in the hearts of men. Wow. Okay. Well, we've just barely touched on the books of Psalms and Proverbs, but what picture of God do you get from these passages about his fairness and transparency? Are you glad that you're dealing with that kind of a God? Amen. Yes. Well, what do you think is the significance of the fact that these two books are written in poetic form? Well, it makes them easier to memorize. We've already talked about that. Do you think there's some people who've memorized portions of maybe complete psalms? I think about Psalm 19 and Psalm 23, for example, and then they repeat them at a time when they think they need that. Wouldn't that be an appropriate thing to do? I've done it myself. Yeah. Jesus did it. Yes. Well, certainly we all probably have had times when maybe Psalm 23 would be appropriate to say, to repeat. It should be obvious from our study so far that we should never be found oppressing one of God's children, especially since God is at the same time trying to help them. So what are you doing? You're fighting against God, right? So let's try to look at the, the bigger picture. Why do we in our church exist? Aren't we supposed to be reaching out to the world, touching people's lives? We're not sure. Well, that's our commission. That's our commission. Well, when he was very young, King David was described as a man after God's own heart, a man of God's choosing, when he was out there herding sheep. 
Acts 13.22, quoting 1 Samuel 13.14. Yet we know that David fell deeply into sin. But the good news about David is that when he was faced with the truth about his behavior, he sincerely repented. You can reread that whole story. You can actually start in 2 Samuel 11 to see a little bit how the story took place and then how it unraveled in chapter 12. While David's deep repentance resulted in God allowing him to continue to rule, it did not prevent disaster in his children. Why do you think that was? I mean, four of his sons died unexpectedly. Do you think they had anything to do with that? process when he was running amok you might say the boys never got proper bringing up and they followed the example of their father yeah in some ways yeah no, when he was it's, not doing so well yeah and yeah. it's just uh, true heart yeah well he forgives but the consequences aren't there yeah well, one of the most famous psalms of all is Psalm 51. It is a psalm talking about David's deep repentance, and Psalm 32 is like it, for what he had done. It is very interesting to notice how Paul used Psalm 51 in the writing of Romans 3. Jim, I think you can help us with that. Psalm 51, verse 4, I have sinned against you, only against you, and not done what you consider evil. So you are right in judging me. You are justified in condemning me. The American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Another uh, translation would be, uh, Against you, you only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. That's the New American Standard uh, Bible. Uh, go down to Romans 3, verses 1 to 4. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will be excuse me, will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Now, hold on a minute. I thought we're talking about the guilt of David back in Psalm 51, but here it's talking about God being on trial. Is that true? Yep. Uh, unfortunately, some translations mistranslate it. Yeah. And have... Uh, how, how, how does that work? What way, what sense is God on trial? Everybody chooses, evaluates God's actions and chooses for or against God. They choose to listen and take instruction or choose to go their own self-centered way and the consequences follow. Okay, let me, uh, let me ask a question. For those of you who are in the United States and you know a little bit about our political system and our judicial system, you know that the president has the option of replacing, when a, when a Supreme Court justice decides to step down, he has the option of replacing that judge. And some presidents of a conservative bent want to replace those judges with conservative judges. And others with a progressive bent want to replace those judges with a progressive judge. What's the difference between a progressive judge and a conservative judge? Well, it's complicated, but it's uh, one person who analyzed the political liberal versus conservative said that conservatives look for truth outside themselves, then ask of a situation, is this right? Is this mm -hmm. just? Liberals tend to look within and then say, does this work? Mm -hmm. And I think that's meant to be a feedback cycle, because you, if you polarizers, you know, if you have people really polarized over here, they could just be doing the same thing over and over mm -hmm. and expecting different results and on the other hand, the other people are, would be always trying to reinvent the wheel. So there needs to be a dynamic that flows there, but basically yeah. the progressives are looking to change things, like the, the Constitution, whereas the progressives or the conservatives. Uh, conservatives are trying to preserve 
the Constitution. They, they see it as uh, what we should do uh, based on what was originally written. Progressives would say, well, no, it's a living document. We can modify it according to the needs of our present time. Okay. Well, <clears throat> but somehow or other, those judges that are waiting to be appointed, how do we know whether they're conservative or progressive? Well, we would look at their records in uh -huh. of uh, what they've done in trials or what they have judged in lower courts, if that's the case. Uh, so we look at their past record. Do you think that we can judge God by looking at his past record? That's what this is. That's what that book is all about. Yes, Gordon, you wanted to see. Well, it's an indication of what that judge may do in the future. Uh, last quarter, at the end of last quarter, we had an interesting quote about progressives and conservatives by G.K. Chesterton in 1924. The whole modern world has divided itself into conservatives and progressives. The business of progressives is to go on making mistakes. The business of the conservatives is to prevent the mistakes from being corrected. <laughs> so everyone's wrong. <laughs> Well, I think in terms of the judgment, you know, the, yeah. the one to come, God is sort of on trial in a sense in how he handles the judgment. Yeah. How is he going to be, the ju be just and the justifier of those who put their faith in Christ? How is this all going to work out? Yeah. So let, let, me put to you, let me put it in light of what you've said. Let me put it to you this way. If the whole world could see Okay, here's what God does, here's how he's handled things and so forth, and here's what the devil does, here's how he's handled everything. Would anybody have any trouble choosing which side they want to be on? Yeah, probably at least a third. <laughs> I mean, it's history. More than a third. Yeah. It, it, well, I'm just going by Revelation uh, yeah. 12. But, okay, it's, but it's just, I, uh, I, I agree with you, but I think you missed my point. If they could see everything that God does, and they could see everything that the devil does, I don't think anyone would choose the devil's side. The only reason the devil got a third to follow his side is because he misrepresented God. Deception. Deception. The deceiver of the whole world. Deceiver Revelation of the whole 12. world, Revelation 12. Well, why do you think God was so merciful to David and yet did not prevent the consequences to his children? Was that fair? Were those the natural consequences of David's bad behavior, or was it the penalties imposed by God? Did his children suffer because of their own sins and behaviors, or was it because of the David's behaviors? The only one, perhaps, could be Bishop's son who died. Which one? That there was a newborn that yeah. died, and yeah, that she was first. Yeah, right, first, the, yeah. the first one that died, and David wept, and he did everything possible, but. Still, the, the one died. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know. With the, other than that, to me, the, the other kid, Absalom, well, he looked for He asked for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rehoboam. Oh, is it Rehoboam? Or the Rehoboam, right. Rehoboam, yes. That was Solomon's, I think. Right. But yeah. you see, these are the ones who made their choices and they reaped the consequences. Well, does it seem right to you that, e that injustice or even murder or violence are increasing or or increasing in our day? Do you, do you see things improving or getting worse? Getting worse. Getting worse. Why do you think that's happening? Angels are, are uh, releasing the winds of strife. Where do you read about that? Revelation. Revelation 7, right. So if God is backing off, and sort of releasing things, who do you think is taking charge? Satan. Lucifer. Wow. From the very beginning, Lucifer said, I can run a better government than God. Angels don't need the restrictions that God places on us. They, they're smart people. They can do what's right just on their own. They can do what they think is right and they'll be just fine. Is that true? Nope. Well, we saw what happened. Well, that's the, the lie. Jesus came to, to do the will of the Father and the basic Luciferian doctrine is do thine own will. Yes. So it's, it's all about the will, as, as Ellen White said. Well, and, and think about, I mean, imagine that you're one of those angels and Satan comes to you and said, you, you, you got a pretty good hat on you. Can't you make, make, up, make up your mind for yourself? I mean, how would you feel about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. 
It goes right? the rebellion of Korah, where he was saying, all of God's people are holy. You, you, Moses, you make too much out of yourself. Yeah. It's basically the same argument. Yeah. Faith in the devil. If you, if we have a, uh, a minute, um, you asked an important question. Uh, the spirit of the Lord is being withdrawn. I, I think, to me at least, I see it in our education system, be it here and around the world. Uh, Satan is really truly taking the grip of the young people. Yes. And uh, and I, to me, I think I see disaster within whatever one, two generations. It's going to be horrible. Well, here's what Ellen White says about that first rebellion. Leaving his place in the immediate presence of the father, Lucifer, well, he's the one who became Satan later, went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. What do we mean by discontent? Unanswered questions, yeah. doubts. He worked with mysterious secrecy. Did he people? Did he want people to know what he was doing? Not at all. And for a time, concealed his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. Well, don't, don't would you like things to be better around here? Maybe we could help God. You know. He began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings, intimating that. The laws might be necessary for the inhabitants of the worlds. Angels, being more exalted, needed no such restraint, for their own wisdom was a sufficient guide. Was it? Obviously not. They were not beings that could bring dishonor to God. I mean, whatever they did, it would be fine, right? All their thoughts were holy. It was not more possible for them than God, for God himself to err. The exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer. So what, what was Lucifer's claim? Jesus stands on one side of God's throne. I should stand on the other side and be completely equal to Jesus. Was he completely equal to Jesus? No. No. So he, he felt that he was, he, he was entitled to the equal reverence and honor. If this prince of angels could be a to attain could but attain to his true exalted position, great good would accrue to the entire host of heaven, for it was his object to secure freedom for all, so you can do what you want to do. Now even the liberty which they had hitherto enjoyed was at an end, for an absolute ruler, Christ, had been appointed them, and to his authority all must pay homage. Is that a kind of um, prison sentence to be have to pay homage to Jesus Christ? Such were the subtle deceptions that through the wiles of Lucifer were fast obtaining in the heavenly courts. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37, uh, paragraph 1. Well, in Psalm 73, and we don't have, maybe I'll have time to read a few verses. Look at, starting with verse 3. Because I was jealous of the proud when I saw that things go well for the wicked. They do not suffer pain. They are strong and healthy. They do not suffer as other people do. They do not have the troubles that others have. And so they wear pride like a necklace and violence like a robe. Their hearts pour out evil and their minds are busy with wicked schemes. They laugh at other people and speak of evil things. They are proud and make plans to, to oppress others. They speak evil of God in heaven and give arrogant orders to everyone on earth so that even God's people turn to them and eagerly believe whatever they say. Why would one of God's people turn to the wicked and believe what they say? Looks like they're prospering, right? What was, what was the Jewish teaching back in the days of Jesus? If you're a good person, the Lord will bless you and you will be rich. So you see the guy walking, riding down the street in a fancy car and what do you know? He's a good man, right? By definition. They say, God will not know, the Most High will not find out if we do something we're not supposed to do. That is what the wicked are like. They have plenty and are always getting more. Does that sound good? It seems to work short term. You know, the, you know, the liberal kind of way of, of looking at things. Yeah, in the, last, in the last part of the psalm, he goes on to describe how the, the righteous will ultimately benefit. I saw their end. Yeah. yeah. Even though it looks what, good now, it's yeah. later. What do you suppose the psalmist was implying when he talked about righteousness happening when he went into the temple? 
What did he learn about the wicked there? Does coming to church and listening to the services and thinking about scripture and so forth, studying the Sabbath school lesson, does does that help us to be better better discriminate between good and evil? Hopefully. It should. <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventists have an almost unique understanding of God's judgment. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 to 10, comparing Daniel 7, 9 to 10, and 13 and 14. What is our understanding? We believe, of course, that when a person dies, his thoughts and so forth are preserved in heaven, but the body remains in the grave, whatever happens to it, and that that person ceases to exist. There's not a soul that escapes and go off some, goes off somewhere. And those soul, those that being, his record from his life, was waited and preserved until the time of judgment. When does the time of judgment take place? The Lord returns. What we sometimes call the pre-advent judgment. And when is that going on? Now. Now. We are the only church that teaches about the pre-advent judgment. Um, we believe it began when? 1844. 1844, October 22. God's judgments take place in the throne room of heaven with four living creatures sitting around God's throne, 24 elders seated on thrones around them, and millions of angels observing Revelation 4 and 5. You can read it for yourself. So we can be sure that everything that God does is totally transparent and completely fair to everyone who is judged. Does that give you confidence in the judgment? Yes. Absolutely. God's judgment is always fair and in favor of the oppressed and hungry. Look at a couple more verses. Psalm 146. He judges in favor of the oppressed and gives food for the hungry. We looked at this earlier. The Lord sets prisoners free and gives sight to the blind. He lifts those who have fallen. He loves his righteous people. He protects the strangers who live in our land. He helps widows and orphans, but takes wicked, takes the wicked to their ruin. So, if we want to be working on God's side, what do we need to be doing? Same things, right? Yes. So, in light of what we have learned in this lesson, what do you think? If, if Jesus were on this earth today, what would he be doing? Helping the oppressed. Helping the oppressed, okay. And who would that be? Where would would he be on Skid Row? Maybe. Maybe. Would he be where the latest disaster took place just took place? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Reaching out to them. Is he God would be on Main Street and yeah. in every business and every hospital, every church? Yeah. He'd be everywhere. Certainly not in light nightclub. Maybe not. <laughs> well, he might even try there. Yes, sir. I believe so. I mean, I, I, I was being, I was being sarcastic. Of yeah. course he's there. No, he's there. Yeah. I mean, lo yeah. look at his best friend, yeah. Mary Magdalene. He has yeah. uh, friends from all over. Absolutely. Right. Well, is God active, active in your community? Think about it. What is he doing in your neighborhood? Is he asking you to join him? What can you learn from the story of David? Does your understanding of his story impact your understanding of the book of Psalms? Does that color your understanding of the book of Psalms? Remember that only about half of the Psalms were actually written by David. A couple of the more popular Psalms were actually written by Moses. And Solomon others wrote different Psalms. A lot of them were written by Asaph, one of David's associates. Well, Think about the story of Solomon. Does that impact your understanding of the book of Proverbs? Should it? Uh, look at two or three verses very quickly. Proverbs fourteen thirty one: If you oppress poor people, you insult the God who made them. But kindness shown to the poor is an act of worship. And look at 29, verse 7. A good person knows the rights of the poor, but wicked people cannot understand such things. Why can't they understand such things? They don't want to. Look at 31, verse 8. Speak up for people who cannot speak for themselves. Protect the rights of all who are helpless. So, how does our understanding of God impact our relationship to the poor? Does our attitude toward the poor imp impact our understanding of God? 
you see those two different questions? If we have the right kind of relationship with God, does it affect our, our relationship to the poor? Yes. yes. If we have our, a, a right understanding of the needs of the poor and our responsibility to reach out to them, does that give us a better understanding of God? It should. Yes. It's to, for us to grow in our understanding of God. In our daily activities, do we treat everyone fairly? Are we willing to speak up for those who for one reason or another cannot speak up for themselves? Are you aware of a significant number of people in your community who are poor and voiceless? Should reaching out to the poor, the homeless, the sick, widows, orphans be a major undertaking in the Seventh-day Adventist Church wherever they live, wherever it is? Shouldn't that be what we're doing? If the Holy Spirit is to be our helper and guide, John fourteen twenty six, could we ask him to guide us as we reach out to others? Yes. Now, earlier we suggested that if we reach out to help the poor and the needy and the widow and the orphan, who's already there helping them? God. Is it a good idea to be working beside God or working against God? With Him. With Him. <laughs> With Him, absolutely. Well... I, I, I think that if we had the opportunity, if we actually took advantage of what we could do, reaching out to the poor and the needy and so forth, working alongside God and, and really being God's hands and feet and reaching out to the people, we would have a much better opportunity to say something to them about God. We sometimes talk about that silent witness. You know, we're just glowing with the, with the glory of heaven. So as we walk down the street, people say, what's special about that person? It's not like that. Uh, but people would notice if we actually reached out to the poor and the needy and the helpless. And those of us who have the chance to work with that kind of people every day in our jobs have a special responsibility and a special privilege to do that. And people notice. I mean, those people really notice when we do that. And I think that should be one of the ways in which we can really reach out and, and, and touch the world because we need, to, we need to find a way to reach out to everyone in our world to get ready for what's coming. What kind of exciting things might happen if we begin to work side by side with the Holy Spirit? I'll let you answer that question. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of sharing your good news with others as we study these lessons together. We thank you for the challenges you've given us to, to do these things. Help us to think about these questions and these motives each time we have an opportunity to reach out to help the poor and the needy. And at the same time, may we do it in a way that correctly represents you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.